Hello guys, I think it started on live. Um, welcome back to my channel. It's just a Monday live Q&A session with myself. Um, can you please tell me if my audio and video quality is okay? I don't think it is, but I spent several hours doing it today and trying to fix it. Way outside of my control. Um, I've got a microphone here. I've got another microphone here. This one seems a bit better. But um, the echoing is horrendous right now, so I'm not sure why that is. Um, I've unplugged, replugged everything in. I've restarted my computer. I've changed the USB sockets. I've reinstalled the software. So I'm pretty much lost. Um, yeah, sound is a lot better. That's good to hear. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. So I've got a... It might be hard to show you, but I basically got a soundboard, which is like a box thing. Um, microphone comes out one end to the other and i've got volume knobs i've got mic gain knobs and i've got some other knobs which i don't know what the knobs do i'm saying knobs um yeah i'm pretty much lost and i've gotten the same settings that i used to have them on so i don't know what's going on there um yeah what happened with the last video that i just aired i don't have a clue all i know is that halfway through the sound quality went really messed up um, so something is a bit out of my control. I don't have a clue what's going on. And what I did spend some time doing today was trying to suss out how to make my um, live, not live, the, um, you tell I'm quite stressed out and spent a lot of time messing around from the computer today. Um, let me give my thoughts. Trying to make my analysis videos better. Um, so the quality of the sound that comes through the video that you watch, the analysed video, is not very good quality. I'm completely lost. I probably need to get someone who's much more expert than I am at technology. Um, I've got a degree in nutrition, not in graphic design and not in computing. Um, so yeah, I'm good at spreadsheets and things like that. But when it comes to computer, tech, hardware, software, I don't have a clue. Um, so we'll see how that goes anyway. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat. That'd be very helpful. Um, and as long as you can hear me, I'm happy to do this live tonight. And hopefully everyone is well. Um, anyway, we've got Lamb, who's kindly joined my chat today. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining. And thank you also for moderating my chat, keeping the um, abundance of trolls away and keeping the flock in line. Very good. Thank God for that. <laughs> Absolute nightmare. Hi, Tracy. How's it going? Hello. I actually just um, went to my mother's room because she's wondering how to access my live YouTube video. I went onto her phone to my own channel, my YouTube channel. And I couldn't find my live video for today. What does that tell you? Um, I don't know what's going on with YouTube right now, but it is very frustrating. Um, I've been looking at my metrics, my analysis of different videos. My, my view to like ratio is in good stead. People do generally like my videos. Um, a very high proportion of people do like my videos. I think it's more so like you get cult following rather than they're actually great videos sometimes, but it all helps. Um, people do spend a lot of time watching my videos as well. Um, my you know, average viewing time, you know, per allotted video length is very good. Um, it seems my videos aren't being put out there, so I don't know why. It's, it seems to be out of my control, which is frustrating. But I'm very persistent. Anyone that knows me knows I run things to the ground until I can't achieve anymore. So we'll see how this goes anyway. Um, I'm not really ultimately trying to get millions of subscribers. It's not really my goal. My goal is just to help some people out and have a bigger impact on people as a as an individual on an individual level um so even if it's not a million people that don't find my information useful but just want to watch me ramble on that's not that great to me um if i can get maybe a couple of thousand people to watch my videos find them useful take something on board you know improve their physique um do it in a safe healthy manner i'm happy with that that's that's ultimately one of my main goals and obviously running my very affordable um, nutrition consultancy business. That's something that I can practice at an expert level. Uh, I don't have too much technical difficulties with that. 
Um, and today I've actually put the black background behind me because, oh, well, I thought it reduced some of the errors I was having with the green screen, which is really frustrating. Anyway, um, I just noticed it's going through very quickly, zipping back and forth. I might have to swear that down. Hello, Patrick. How's it going? Thanks for joining my um, videos and commenting recently. I, I do appreciate that a lot. It does it does help, I think. I can only imagine how bad my videos would come out if I wasn't getting likes and comments from people like yourself. So I do appreciate that. Hey, Val, how's it going? Do you have any questions today? I'm very glad that you've um, joined my chat today to ask me some stuff. Good evening, Jonathan. That's my mum. Hi, mum. You're famous. Yeah, no. Yeah, mum, if you've if you got any questions to ask me about um, nutrition, diet, well, nutrition is diet, is it? I don't know. Um, exercise, anything related around that, anything I can advise you with, that'd be very much um, possible. Hey, Nick, how's it going? I'm going to moderate this in the chat right now to um, moderate my mum's ramblings. So. In case anyone's wondering, if someone has a spanner next to their name, a blue spanner, it means that they're a moderator. Um, so it means they can delete comments usually and stuff like that, or mute users. Um, please kindly don't mute my mum, because that wouldn't be very nice. You're an amazing inspiration. Why do you say that out of interest? Um, what, what, like, I'm not... You know, what's your, what's your background that makes you want to say this? Quite surprised, but thank you. I'll, I'll take that. Is Doctor Fade hopping on later? I'm not sure where she is. Um, I just started it and thought, there we go. I'll start it now. Um, I was expecting her to see her in the chat in the the like the, the meeting room basically, but she wasn't there, so I don't know. I expect she's probably busy or something has cropped up. Um, she's not the sort of person to be unreliable, so. She may just not be here. Um, I can't make any guarantees at this point or be certain of where her whereabouts is. Do you think I should do a fast all at all this week? No. Nah. Now you're not far off your goal, Sophie. I mean, you can do. Um, just got to remember every time you do something, it usually causes something. Um, it will expedite your results. But it could also ruin your results down the line. Um, what I mean by that is... If you're going to do it and you're going to be ravenous and hungry, that can be quite bad. Um, but, you know, you're quite sensible now. You're quite good at restricting your eating. I think you probably could do it maybe a day or two, maybe three days. Um, you're at the point where you're still building muscle. You're trying to train intensely. So it could be that you just don't eat on the days that you work and maybe you're not able to get in the gym. You know, um, I don't think there has to be an exact pattern to it or schedule. Um, I think historically we would fast for periods of time and it wouldn't kill us. Um, I just advise people to be in a fat adapted state prior to doing this to reduce the issues of electrolyte imbalances and things like that. Hey, Zbigniew, how are you doing? And please update me uh, through the chat with how you're doing some very... For it, uh, I've been very concerned about you. Um, and Sophie's also been sending her best wishes. Hello. Managed. It's good to. Who she thinks it's starting at 7 pm? No. No. So I sent her the direct link. Um, so if she clicks on it, she will have seen it starts at 6. Um, I also said it starts at 6 because that's the best time for me at the moment. Um, when I'm at Sophie's, it'll probably be 7. I'm not sure. Um, we'll just see what happens. So, but if she does add to get out of the chat, I'll just see a picture of her below. Then I'll click add to stream, something like that. It'll be simple. Hmm. I think Big Niv's got um, an unsteady hand at the moment. Or is autocorrect is playing silly buggers. That's good. 
Yeah, well done. Is your is the why hopefully the Wi Fi is quite good. I know it can be quite mind numbing when you're in hospital. Um listening to all the beeping and the sounds and the that drove me nuts. Um I actually had two compression boots on my my feet and ankles when I was in hospital for a few days. They just kept them running and I was like, This is driving me nuts. Like throughout the night, lying your side, then on your ankles are like puff up and you're pfft, 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 all throughout the night. Because you can never lie still, it driven insane. But um, you might not need that sort of thing. You might just have uh, oxygen or something in your nose, maybe. I don't know. That's good to hear. Very good. Yeah, I'll be having two meals today, a work day. So maybe I'll do two two mad on work days. Yeah, it's completely fine. Um, two mad is a pretty standard way of eating for most people. I think to do the carnivore diet. I know a lot of people do. One meal a day, but I don't know. I wouldn't get obsessed with it really. I think mean, if you're eating enough in any amount of meals that you're having to you know give your insulin levels a little bump, I don't think it's gonna be a big issue. Um now I wouldn't be doing maybe six meals a day. Um I can't really think of an example when you would, at least some people that I speak to. Um two mad, three mad, oh mad, pretty good. Um, and o OMAD is, by the way, for people I don't know, is um, one meal a day. That was, that's just what it means. I don't know what it meant before. I thought it's some sort of weird training thing, like AMRAP, like which means as many reps as possible. Sophie, how long do you fast? I think Sophie does um, usually three meals per day. She does a meal at about roughly half seven in the morning um around about 12 to 1 p.m then another meal usually 6 7 p.m roughly around then so just three relatively equally split meals per day uh, i'm doing i did three meals today already i've got one more meal later i find if i have a shake at all during the day so protein shake with some raw eggs raw milk then i'll do probably four meals just because i think feel like I feel like a shake isn't really a meal it's more just it goes down the hatch and it's nutritious um it's not satiating at least in the same way that food is you know when i say food i mean you know meat fish whatever it is i usually get my stomach one yeah i'm not surprised i bet that is quite uh, quite iffy um my best advice is like i said before just listen to your body it sounds a bit like vague but if your body's not hungry it means don't eat if you're ravenous and you think god i could redo with some um a really salty steak or some beef jerky or something or just eat that um eat something which is going to digest well ultimately because you don't want to be causing any discomfort appreciate you are in a lot of discomfort right now so i'm not not saying it's easy at all by any means i, I know how you feel if i start fasting find myself feeling really hungry then i listen to what i eat and put stuff right there brilliant yeah i did the same thing actually um i think it was yesterday so I was going to do a fast, but my body seemed to respond well to just eating a lower energy breakfast and a lower energy uh, dinner. I didn't need to. And I thought, I had this, you know, the thing about fasting, is I think it is very useful as a tool for people, but for me, it made me anxious, which I don't like feeling. Um, I've got a lot of weight to maintain, a lot of mass to keep on my body. I don't really want to be swinging massive amounts off at it day to day. I don't think it's very useful. Um, you know, obviously the bigger you are in terms of in relation to your natural homeostatic equilibrium state of being an average human being um the more you have to kind of swing the pendulum in the side of feeding and having more insulin in your bloodstream um so it means more food effectively but that's where bodybuilding isn't healthy because you're doing something which isn't naturally compatible if that makes sense not mobile too much. Okay. But in a good mood. Yeah, I'm glad you're in a good mood. That's what's important. It's, um, I think it does help your healing a lot, you know? I mean, some of my best recovery days when I felt like, you know, a few days have gone by and I think, oh, I can move a bit more now. I feel more energetic, whoever it is. Um, it does seem to be when my mood, mood's elevated and I feel better. So I can definitely speak on that. Very good. Excellent. Excellent to hear. Very, very, very good. 
I've not fasted before. No, I think. I think we may have done one before. I can't remember. I'm not sure. I'm curious how my recovery progresses on carnival. Yeah, you'll find that it'll be quicker than whatever it'll be on any other diet. You're reducing excess inflammation. You're putting the right nutrients in your body to modulate the inflammation that is appropriate to heal. Um, so I think you'll be just fine. Um, that's not to say that you won't be in pain or it won't be easy, um, but you'll, I think you'll be fine. Yeah. A Wi Fi hospital. That's good. Yeah, I'm glad. Glad I'm able to provide some carnival ramblings to keep you entertained whilst you're at hospital. Um, if you do have any questions, as big as you know, just just feel free to ask. Feel free to me, or you know, if you want me to cover any topics that are um, current or you're wondering about, I'm happy to sort of go on a little ramble on a little um, tangent as I do. Please um, let me help provide the entertainment. Yeah, I bet it is. Yeah, I don't like smells um, in hospital. I don't like lights either. They kept coming in at night to like draw blood or you know check blood pressure. They're like, oh, do you need to turn the light. No, you don't need to turn the light on. Don't don't do that. Just open the door slightly, and you can see what's going on. <laughs> you can imagine how difficult I was as a patient. Actually, actually, I was probably the easiest patient I've ever had because I didn't ask for anything. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, smell and light are two things in hospital which really annoy me, and sound as well. That's good. Hey, Michael, how you doing? Nice to see you on my channel. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat below, and I'll be happy to get to them. The more specific they are, the better I'll be able to help you. Food hospital's crap. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in hospital, it was um. I'm trying to think now. Breakfast was there was no protein in the breakfast, and the best you could get for protein was a fruit or yogurt. Um, I had to specially order uh, boiled eggs. I got, I think, one one day and one slice of toast and one little knob of butter. And that was it. So it wasn't a lot of food. Um, I needed energy at that point. My insulin wasn't running so low. My blood pressure was running horrendously low for me. Um, heart rate was low. I just needed anything which would get into my system. So, yeah, you'll, you'll find a way. But um, fortunately, Sophie came in and delivered delivered the goods. I had no appetite in hospital. Um, I couldn't really eat anything. Um, I was in so much pain, but Sophie did give me some protein bars. They're usually hyper palatable. Um, they're a bit better than eating like a packet of crisps, like a packet of Pringles or something, but they're not the best food. Um, but ultimately you need to recover, you need nutrients in the system. If you lost blood, maybe that would indicate that you need more food in as well. Iron, if you can get it in. Any, any sort of real food you can get in will be the best choice. Mm. Hello, Jerome. How you doing? Nice to see you. Six a day is mad. Yeah, I used to do six meals a day, and I found that my mind you actually run lower. Um, I think there's like a balance you get. Um, for me, it seems to be about four meals is about best, based on my current um, energy expenditure activities, intake. Um, I find free is a bit much. I feel a bit stuffed after free. It might just be the way my digestive system is. Like maybe I don't, or well, I know I don't produce much much stomach acid because of my um, previous proton pump inhibitor medication use. However, um, I'm 99% carnivore, so I can say that much and say it has helped. But yeah, I think most people are doing about two meals per day that I speak to. That seems quite common. So, yeah. Question. In terms of, sorry, in terms of hypertrophy, your muscles have two kinds of fibrous muscle. One's that grow from low rep ranges and two that fiber that grows from high rep ranges. Is this true? Um, strictly speaking, no. You're talking about sacroplasmic hypertrophy and myofibrillar hypertrophy. So, I need to get this out of the way, you can't see. Ooh. Sacroplasmic is when the muscle cells swell up, um, so there's more volume within that cell, that, um, muscle unit. Then, what was the other one? 
myofibrillar is when you actually get more muscle cells, muscle fibers, if that makes sense. Um, it's quite hard to get more muscle fibers. Now, the idea is if you live at lift a heavy enough load, you'll stimulate more of that. Um, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. I think it's quite a, a tedious endeavor to micromanage your repetition ranges to get more of a certain type of muscle fiber. Um, what I do know is that if you find a repetition range for yourself that is safe, um, for, me, for myself and many people, I recommend somewhere between six and 20. Now, when I say 20, I mean you're failing at around 20. Um, that's usually the case where you're failing at 20 repetitions, but you're doing rest, pause sets, cluster sets, myo reps, your widow makers. You're finding a way to get to 20 without actually doing 20 straight, usually. Um, the main integral factor, the critical point, if you're trying to build up more muscle, is the intensity. Um, we can always add more sets, always add more reps, but ultimately you need to give that muscle a stimulus to grow. Now, if you're doing six reps, you're going to be performing under less time and tension. Now, you can still get enough time and tension. It just means that you're going to be using a heavier weight. Now, this can be, can be, not always, but can be more injurious for some people. For myself, if I was to do a, say, I, I've had spine fusion surgery uh, two and a half months ago, roughly. If I look down the line and think, okay, four months from now, I want to do a bent over row. For me, a safe repetition range is going to be much closer to 20 than it is going to be to six. Um, six reps for me of bent over row is extremely heavy. Um, it's probably, I guess from what I used to, it's probably about 140 plus kilos. So maybe 300 pounds. Um, I'm not going to be wanting to do that, you know, any point in the future, at least, at least with how my recovery is currently. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. So you've got to find a, a safe, um, effective, repetition range now when you're hitting that repetition range the caveat is that you're failing you're using technical in my opinion i prefer technical muscular failure to hit that repetition range so bart k is a proponent of doing the least to get the most this does make sense to me um you're putting in the minimum amount of effort dose well well, that's not quite the right way of saying it. You're picking minimal amount of volume, which you can recover from, while still maximizing the load and standardizing your technique. So six repetitions to eight repetitions is useful. Um, it takes less time. You know, if you're doing 10 sets of six versus 10 sets of 20, the six repetitions or eight repetitions will be quicker to perform. It's not going to be as much as a, a debt recovery system, assuming that that repetition amount is still hitting to failure. Um, I think there's room in people's training to add in some intensifiers, like the ones I just mentioned, um, widow makers, cluster sets, rest pause, whatever. Um, I'm not much of a fan of rest pause training. Reason being is that a lot of people select the wrong exercise to do it with. I think rest pause in the case of doing a bench press is very bad for your shoulders. Um, rest pause in the case of using dumbbells at least if you're very strong i'm not myself maybe using 60 kilogram plus dumbbells in some cases um that will tear my shoulder in half and it'll be hard for me to rack it on my knees so that's where i'd use a machine um i think it's safer you can drop the weight and it's not going to kill you so that's kind of where i stand on sacroplasmic versus myofibrillar muscle fiber growth and i've spoken to people over the years that have tried both methods and they don't notice a difference they will do the high reps, they'll do the low reps. What it comes down to is how hard you're able to effectively train while standardizing form. Um, then in that area, there's a bracket where you'll feel that you train best. So your levers, your length of your arms, for example, might impact the way you lift a weight. Um, if, for example, I was doing a six repetition bicep curl with a bar, that's probably more likely to damage my wrists than doing a 20 repetition set. I'm talking either end of the extreme here. It could be a seven repetition, eight, you know, all up to 20. I'm just using a broad examples to make it um, my point a bit clearer. But hopefully that answers your question. Um, I wouldn't be too focused about individual muscle fiber building, if that makes sense. 
is breakfast that important start of the day or large lunch um depends when you wake up man um so if you're waking up early there's it seems sensible to eat at a time that you feel hungry um if you wake up and you're not hungry probably don't eat um but if you're if it's not practical to eat in the morning because you're busy because you have a client or something then you'll eat after that client um you'll find a way um i think ultimately you want to focus on for yourself things like sleep going to bed at a sensible time waking up at a sensible time getting appropriate sunlight throughout the day um I don't believe in grazing or snacking. The reason being is that it just produces these small little bumps in insulin um, throughout the day, which mean that you never actually hit muscle protein synthesis to recover effectively. Um, I know you're not a bodybuilder, so it's not that important to you. I think if you're eating, say, five meals throughout the day, even if it's a cracker with a slice of cheese in it, I don't think that's good for your body. Um, I think you should have times of um, fasting and feasting. When I say feasting, I don't mean eat, you know, a giant Toby Carver roast dinner. I mean, eat a meal where you eat your meal and you hit the point that, you know, the bliss point when you think, I quite enjoyed that. I don't really fancy any more on my plate. Then you should stop eating. Um, so that's where intuitive eating comes in. So you'll find your own sort of way that works with you. I find people that tend to have small meals throughout the day tend to actually eat more. Um, this is just my anecdotal experience, which I seem to see a lot of people. I think if you can hit a good meal first in the day, and that will carry you through to the rest of the day, maybe give it a few hours, um, you'll eventually get to a point where you'll find how many meals you want to eat each day. Um, it's important to recognize whether you're eating for the sake of eating. Um, most people eat because they're bored, funny enough. Um, some people eat in large volumes. Um, and they'll do OMAD, so one meal a day, because they're obsessed with food. Because they can't think or understand or conceptualize how much food that you need in one hit. They'll, they'll be eating to their stuff and fall asleep after. They'll think, oh, that was good, you know, nice and full, you know. Um, that's never good. I, think, I don't think you should ever stuff yourself. I think that's where you run into issues where you start chasing that feeling. Um, people often use that stuffing behavior to fulfill a emotional vo avoid they have with food you know because they want you want to feel full they associate feeling full with being comfortable you know um being full isn't good i think you should eat until that 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 point i just mentioned earlier where you um get the required nutrients in you don't fancy any more food then eat when you're next hungry so hopefully that answers your question You're welcome to buy the next lot of um, raw milk from the down the line as well if you want to offer me a donation for my lovely answer i decided to fast until the first six hours no problem yeah fair enough yeah if, if you're not hungry don't don't stress honestly jonathan as a carnival bodybuilder how many meals do you consider i'm doing omad what is your advice um i think it depends how big you are so So what I mean by this is if you look at, say, for example, Bart K, he's not a bodybuilder, um, but he'd be doing one meal per day. He's a smaller gentleman. He's a small structure. He's not overly physically active. He's not weightlifting. His requirement for food will be less than mine. Um, so he eats one meal per day. I eat about three or four. Now, if you look at someone like Eddie Hall, assuming Eddie Hall was a carnival bodybuilder, um, he might be eating four or five or maybe even six because he has more mass. He has a lot of weight to keep on. Um, I think there is a mild benefit to having more than one meal per day for building muscle. I don't think it's crucial, but I think it does help somewhat. Um, the reason being is if, for example, you're like myself, 250 pounds with 90 kilos approximately of fat-free mass, um, you're going to need a lot of protein now you're going to look be looking at the, the area under the curve for protein synthesis and um, you can bump this about about four times per day maybe five for some people but um that's broadly what the research would suggest to me at least from what i understand of it um now i wouldn't be only splitting up your meals for the sake of it 
if they're tiny meals. Um, I think you do have to eat enough in a given meal to give yourself that that bump in um, insulin and protein synthesis and all those kind of like corresponding cascading hormones. Um, now there will be people out there, I'm sorry, that eat the carnivore diet and their body build and they'll be eating one meal per day. There'll be people that, you know, on either end of the spectrum. Um, this is just my opinion. So you've got to find what works for you. Um, if you wanted like a very specific answer where I could really write you down a proper training plan, a diet plan, whatever you want me to do, um, free, feel free to consult with me in the link above when it comes back up. Um, outside of that, it's quite an individualized question, but you're welcome to ask some more questions and perhaps I can give you more detail with a bit, a bit more context. That'd be useful. Thank you for your advice. My pleasure. No worries. Cheers, Patrick. Fasting when you're in hospital is probably the best thing to do. Good call. They sell several crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, the problem was with me where I had to eat and my blood pressure ran very low. My heart rate was very low. I needed food. And I'm a big guy. Um, my muscle mass is about double the average human man. The average man has maybe 50 kilos. I have about 90 of like fat free mass. So, it takes a lot to sustain me. Um, I do tend to feel crap if I don't eat. Um, I think what happened with me is I had to have an egg and cheese omelet with a portion of chips, so potato, potato fries, French fries, I don't know, what um, or a baked potato or something. I had to have that at the hospital because it was the only way I could get salt into my system, and I knew I needed salt. Um, the, my diet prior to the hospital was in such a way that I needed more salt. Um, I needed fat and I needed protein. Um, I wasn't doing any fasting protocols prior to the surgery because I wanted to make sure I had everything inbound, in store, ready to use to recover. So, yeah. Um, pay attention to hydration, big nerve. Um, have some salty water if you can, if you crave it. If you get a taste for it, have some of that. I'll be, update you on Sunday. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that. How did you wean off the PPIs? Me. I'm trying to get a friend of mine off of them, but it seems to be a struggle. Um, I used quite a multifaceted approach. So the things I was looking at was not drinking too much water. Every time you drink too much water, you do dilate, dilute your stomach acid. Um, it does regulate itself quite well, actually very well. But when you're trying to put food down and you've got loads of water in there, it's going to take longer to flush it through you, you know? Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, I used betaine hydrochloride to help acidify my gut. Um, I got rid of all the plants, of course, because they're not useful. I didn't eat anything like that. Um, I increased my fat intake. I, in hindsight, I would have tried to use less painkillers. Um, I, I did try to, but I think I would have just went cold turkey off them. Um, I think that will affect your, your gut, your system as it is, um, reduce your stomach acidity. And all the sort of parts of your digestive system so your you know, well your liver kidney gallbladder what's the other one intestines they all work in sync so i think if you can maximize the health of those four organs you're going to minimize the need or desire to use ppis um, you can also use digestive enzymes as well they help um, i'm not overly convinced about digestive enzymes but i think they are probably useful i'd say the betaine hydrochloride was more useful to me um through cause and effect testing in terms of how i felt how i digested food um i did go cold turkey off them yeah i mean obviously the carnivore diet's useful so i think that's probably what i'd do i'd probably look at the water intake first try and reduce that um make sure you have well your friend has plenty of salt as well so that will provide him with the chloride you need to acidify the gut, assuming that the gut was less acidic in the first place. Yeah, 
it's amazing. And Meprazole and things like that are only meant to be used for about three weeks at a time, something like that. Um, however, medical practitioners can you can um, prescribe these off label for other things for much longer. They get away with it somehow. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, was, I believe I was using them for about three months, maybe longer, maybe less. I can't remember. But um, I was using them at a point in time when I was throwing up every day for three months straight. I'd wake up, I'd go to the loo, and I'd throw up. I'd go back to bed. Then I'd start to feel better once I had some salt, uh, hydrated better, had some food. But it was a continuous cycle. Um, and they didn't help that. They didn't expedite my recovery or healing in any way possible. Um, my advice is probably different to what the healthcare professional might give without saying too much. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Intestinal permeability is a real thing. Um, for example, I know myself, um, Sophie might be able to tell you the story, but when I had some paracetamol recently, I had an, an, an issue. Uh, my guts weren't, I had, I'm talking about like one or two doses. My guts knew it the next day. Um, no idea. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when you leave, when you read the label of most medicines, um, if people read them, I strongly suggest looking at all the print, you know, the, the recommended use, when to stop, when to start. You'd be quite shocked in the side effects. They're unbelievable. I know they've got to cover their own backs when you think, I'm taking this for like one thing, but it could cause me to have about 50 other things to go wrong with me. You know, I'm not negging the medical industry entirely, but I'm saying there's a time and a place. And I don't know if the time is always put in the right place. If that makes sense. I don't know. I'm rambling. Question. So someone is someone trying to maximize muscle mass, eat four times a day to maximize mTOR. Or is it two meals enough? Um, depends how big the person is. I mean, a tiny person will only have a certain requirement of protein. Um, so let I'll, I'll give you some numbers to, these are arbitrary, but they might give you an idea. So for example, if I'm having 250 grams of protein per day, um, I'll need a threshold amount to get protein synthesis split throughout the day. Um, say it was 40, 50, 60 grams, I don't know, whatever it happens to be. Um, I could do that over four meals. However, someone smaller, eating 100 grams of protein per day, they'll they'll probably only have two, maybe three meals to maximize protein synthesis because they'll need a certain threshold per meal. So that's how it kind of factors in. Um, I think two meals is enough for probably most people. Um, people like you, Jerome, maybe three meals. I mean, you're a bit bigger than the average person, of course, so that might be more useful. But saying that, I don't think it makes a huge difference. Um, with bodybuilding, we're always dealing with marginal increases in a benefit. For example, up there, I've got a, a, a big tub of creatine monohydrate. Do I think it's going to make my results 10% better? No. I'm looking at maybe 1%. So it's kind of like one of those sort of things. Um, I think it's a case of trial and error. So that person might find that. If they're eating two meals per day and they still grow, if they ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, they're recovering fine, they're not overly sore, they're still getting stronger, things like that. Um, carry on. You know, I wouldn't adjust it. Until that person hits a plateau, um, you'd obviously address the training side of it, recovery, um, the quality of the food they're eating. If they've nailed all those things, you could try three meals per day and see if that's useful. I think that's probably the most sensible advice I'd give. Um, but it's like myself, I mean. I think I'd be the same size right now as I currently am on two meals per day, assuming I could eat those two meals with the same volume of food, same mass of food that I would have in four meals. But I can't do that. I can do it, but I don't feel very good doing it. So that's that's kind of how you factor it in. Um, that's why I say trial and error. So as vague as it sounds, it's probably the best bet um, you might have. That's a very good question, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, your voice to te text speech is awful sometimes. Any supplement brands you recommend? My dad's convinced China is trying to kill us. Americans were poisoning us up in, in food. Um, I'll be more, I'll be more concerned about home territory feeding 
than other countries, in my opinion, especially where you're from. Um, I use a pro product from the UK called Arctic Bug Supplements or Nutrition. I don't know if it kind of shows you. Um, this is basically something called Polar Bear Juice. It's got reasonably well dosed um, ingredients. I think most of them are quite useful. So this is something I use it is a pre-workout. I do have a affiliate link. It's just Jonathan G15. Um, I don't think these are necessary, but I quite like pre-workouts. So that's my little opinion. There. Um, outside of that, looking what I've got up here, there's not many that are any good. Um, Supplement brands. I mean, depends. If you're looking at nutritional herbal vitamin supplements, um, probably one of the best ones in the UK that I think is, is anyway, is called Viridian Nutrition. They do stringently test their things. I have spoken to people within that company on a personal level. Um, they are very tough on these sort of things. Um, outside of that, there's another one. It's got an orange and white label, I believe. Um, I can't think of it for life of me. It's an American brand anyway. Um, yeah, message me off air and I'll try and remember what it is. But I believe it's got an orange and white label, maybe blue. I'm not sure. I know it's got orange. So why is your dad using supplements? It, it might be that I can advise him on something to use, which would be more effective or not to use at all. I did, um, I did manage one of the best health food shops in my country for a year or two um, before I left because of my um, disease, but yeah. H HCL, enzymes, upside of it, it was all giving him good. It's a real struggle for him to get him kind of around. Uh, yeah. Interesting. I think that he'll need a very slow, tapered approach. Um, I can see apple cider vinegar being a complete waste of time. Um, if you look at the pH of that food for what it's worth, then look at the pH of your stomach. They're incompatible. You'd be diluting the stomach to a higher, less acidic pH. Um, struggling to can't. I mean, even if they did like avocado, some berries and carnival high fat carnival diet is gonna be a bit better than what they are doing already cut cut back from one starch meal per day to half a starch meal per day um load up on fat try if it's the appetite this issue try the leptin reset protocol by jack cruz um could probably link you to that if you want to like a copy of it or to read more about it um yeah, I think it's a slow sort of transition to the diet if he does want to do it. If not, of course, as you would just relay the information on that, they're going to seriously harm themselves by carrying on the way they are. You know, uh, I'm still dealing with some of the damage I've got now from using PPIs, I, I think, anyway. You know, I have to be so strict to my diet compared to a lot of people. I look, I am healthy and I look healthy in that sort of way, but. My body doesn't always agree with foods that I put in that aren't compatible, so I'm paying the price now, you know. So yeah, I, hopefully they'll sort it out. Sophie's answered your question about um, paracetamol, in case anyone wants to know. Listen, hey Claire, how's it going? Do you have any questions for my small YouTube channel? Jonathan's joined. Who's Joe? Um, I'm preparing myself to go with another three to five day fast. I'm doing really good, bro. It's good to hear. Brilliant. Yeah, be careful with getting the habit of fasting. I see a lot of people becoming emaciated from it, um, getting heart palpitations. And I know it's something we would do historically in the past. Um, we would not eat for a few days and feast for a bit. Um, what I'm saying is don't get addicted to it. Um, people like the empty feeling and they find abuse in it. 
and it is a very 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 useful tool um just be careful and I'm, I'm not saying this to be condescending but i'm saying it just as a word of caution don't don't go down the the path of eating you know four meals per month i don't think that's advantageous to human health um i know you're not saying that but just people watch this in the the video later and i don't want to sort of think i think people should never eat you know question what do you think about bulk supplements i see many ads i think they're highly expensive and the price of them is ridiculous and the taste of them is not very good they used to be a very reputable supplement shop um, online presence i'm not a fan anymore um now they do some individual powders you know of different things which are quite useful like in their isolated form but the protein powders taste rubbish like really not very good you know and i'm a sort of person i try all these things um trying to find what i've got down here hold on so i've got bodybuilding warehouse you can see the green screen this is just a bag of taurine obviously but um they do protein powders and things like that probably equivalent of about 17 18 euros per kilo which isn't too bad um is grass-fed way if you're into that sort of thing um i'd look at i'd look at the individual products themselves so if you send me um links to what you're interested in what you, what you want me to answer about different things i can give you some ideas um generally speaking most supplements are pretty much useless um but if it's a you know a food supplement like a protein powder i can see some practical use in it i'm a little biased because i do like them i do use them sometimes but um you know, I think, I think food, whole food is best, but there's some, there are some useful supplements in a case where you're trying to expedite some results in some cases. To be very specific, though. But that takes some vitamin and sometimes D3. No specific reason. Just thinking both are generally good for overall health. I probably wouldn't bother with more vitamin. Um, I don't know. We'll probably have to speak to him to suss out what he's doing and if he really needs it. The thing is, these multivitamins are based on non-science. Um, the idea that we have a RDA, the average lot of people, to ward off deficiencies is absurd. Um, the reason being, when we change our diet at all, my diet will be different to yours. Um, so my nutrient intake will be... Although we both eat a kind of all diet, my nutrient intake will be different to yours. My requirements will be different. So that's completely off the rails in terms of what I think about um, RDAs, you know, reference values. I don't think that's useful. Now, I think some supplements are useful when transitioning to a carnivore diet. Um, some electrolytes are useful. Vitamin D3, I think, is very useful if you cannot get sunlight at least adequate sunlight. Um, you know, I mean, if you're looking, I assume your, your dad's probably a bit older than mine. Um, if he's older, you know, he's indoors a lot, maybe, he'll benefit from vitamin D3. I can think that would be useful. I'd probably get a tablet or a capsule rather than an oil. Um, these things do go quite rancid quite fast. Um, depends on the world where you are and the quality assurance testing where you, where you live. If it, if you're in the US, for example, the quality testing of supplements is very, very, very poor. Even this ISO 9001 CGMP certified stuff is rubbish. That's not tested properly. Um, but then I think that if you're in a different country, the UK or the EU does have much more stringent legislation on supplements in terms of meeting label requirements. Um, third party testers do come in, it seems. But yeah, I, I can't really see a need for it. Um, maybe stick on just the D3 tablet or a capsule. Try to get all that, all the fillers and rubbish in it. Uh, make sure it is vitamin D3. Um, take it with a fatty meal. Um, ideally, probably around 10, 11 a.m. if you can, or, or breakfast, whatever's easier. It's probably your best bet for absorption as well. So hopefully that's useful. How do I break? I still, I st still around 100 pounds, please. I eat enough calories about within my feeding days. Yeah, 
calories. Rich, have you seen my video on calories in and calories out versus mass balance model? I think you might find that one useful, um, especially if you're someone that's actively trying to lose excess body fat, assuming you're trying to lose excess body fat and not just waste away into a pulp. Um, yeah, you, you probably find some cognitive benefits as well. I mean, I do feel a bit sharp when I do it, but once I get past that like 40 hour mark, I feel a bit buzzy in space. I don't like it. Um, just the way my disposition is, I don't like to feel overly hyped. Makes sense. I'll probably wrap this up in about five, 10 minutes, guys. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat below. If you would like to donate to my channel, feel free to do so through my website, which is above. I do have three options for donations, five pound, 10 pound and 25 British pounds. Um, that money will go directly to my bank account and it won't be impacted by third party platforms that the, these videos air on. So that's more helpful to me if you're trying to benefit my channel at all. Um, however, of course, if this is easy for you, you're welcome to put a super chat or a super thanks or a super sticker through the chat. Um, that's also much appreciated as well. If you wanted to just become a member of my channel, there's three options. There's Jim Rats, Jim Bros and Jim Pros. These are three different tier options. Um, they do allow you to donate to my channel at quite a reasonable amount. Um, many of the people that do donate currently are actually in the live chat right now. And yeah, they do help me out a lot. Um, they attend all my live streams. They're active in the chat and they help grow my small YouTube community. Um, I do find it, I, I do find I'm very um, blessed in that sense because it does help support support me because it shows that I've got substance. You know, people um, like what I have to say or find what I have to say funny. Or they, they like my ramblings, maybe I don't know. So I do appreciate it. That's my that's my plug. I, I usually do that once at least in a video, just so people know to send me money for free. <laughs> I'm just I'm just teasing you. Don't you? No one's obliged, by the way, to give me any money. So don't don't worry. You know. Just um, just don't give me money if you're in a, not in a position to do that. I don't want people stressing about paying for their next meal. Um, I was not adapted to fast and had many symptoms, but I go for it and now my energy when eating and fasting is the same. That's good to Yeah, that's very good to There's some little biohacks you could use to do when you're fasting. Um, well, I won't go into them in this video because I'll have to make another video on fasting, I think, at some point. Um, have you checked out my video on fat fasting? It's quite useful. Um, it's I know you're probably you're just doing a water fast, which is very good, but fat fasting might give you some ideas as well and might help provide you with some information you might not have otherwise known. So yeah, just giving you guys an update. Um my back pain, hip pain, you know, whatever it is. The the hip pain is still very bad and when i'm walking around it's very bad when i'm laying down at night it's maybe 10 percent better which suggests to me that it is healing up a little bit um i've not done anything drastic i've not really done much i've done some walking um not been able to work out legs really at all uh, i might try work out tomorrow and see how i get on it would just be like leg curls and leg extensions which never impact my my hips or back at all so it should be fine um i'll do some calves as well because you'll keep your calves working i think outside of that i'm just doing three or four bills per day um, i'm having a glass of milk with most of our meals I'm doing some raw eggs sometimes i'm doing a lot of eggs and i must admit um, lots of cheese as well i quite like that um i eat just as much salmon as i do beef funnily enough i find I'm. I know not not many people eat the same sort of diet I do. You know, I eat a lot of eggs, a lot of dairy, and a lot of oily fish, salmon. Um, I find it funny because if I was to do a beef, you know, beef and eggs diet or something more sim simple, I wouldn't quite feel as good. It makes me wonder, like, why is my biology that different to other people? Is it that I'm temporarily going through something which means my nutrient requirements are slightly different to other people's? I don't know. Um, I've just noticed I've always felt better with some fish in my diet. So that's my own individual little thing. 
Fat fasting was what helped me to adapt to water. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Fat fasting was so easy. I mean, I did it, uh, I think, last Monday for it. Must have been like 45, 46 hours, something like that. I didn't, when I, do, when I do fasting, I never time it really. I sort of have an idea. I want to do at least a day or whatever it is. Um, I'll just eat when I'm hungry or whenever it, the schedule rolls around, sort of thing. Um, and I was not hungry at all. And I ate about 200 grams of fat and maybe 20 grams of protein. So it still fitted within the usual aspects of a fat fast. Um, I don't know if it was that. I don't know if it's that useful outside of becoming more fat adapted, but we'll see. I think Jacqueline has joined the chat, which is very good. I need to add it to the stream. Hello. Hello. Hello there. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm not too bad, thanks. Yeah, I've just been doing some carnival ramblings for about an hour or so, just chilling out. I think I saw, like, just before I was about to come in, that you had a something pr premiering on YouTube right before this. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I um, sent you, Sophie did to me earlier, so I wasn't sure if I sent you the 6 p.m. or the 7 p.m. booking. I can't remember for the life of me. Well, my time, 2 p.m., so here's yeah. 7 p.m., yeah. That's right. Yeah, it must have been, because I've, I've been having these about 6 p.m. recently, um, mm. but I think what happened was I changed it and thought I'd be back on the 7 p.m. schedule, but I'm good to go. Anyway, you're on, you're on the live now anyway, so hopefully people will stick around. We've had about 10 to 15 people at any given time, which is oh, really awesome. good. Yeah, so what have you been up to today? Uh, let's see. Today, it's a holiday here. It's like President's Day, I think. Schools are mm. closed. Uh, so I got to chill a bit, walk my dog nice and leisurely in the morning. It's actually a decent uh 55 degrees fahrenheit which is not bad for us over here in this time of year and uh did a little workout had a little beef arm roast and some bone marrow and uh yeah and then just uh kind of relaxed until i came on here so it's been a, it's been an easy day been a nice day yeah i did um did a workout about 11 a.m. today. I did just upper body. Mm. Um, it felt like quite a light workout, but then I say that, but then someone watches my Instagram story or they'll say, that's not light. And I'm like, it was light for me. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> a bit weird. But, um, it's all relative. Yeah. Yeah. It's all relative, isn't it? You know, like your your 10 push ups will be like, um, it could be a different amount to mine, sort of thing. But if, if you're a higher or lesser body weight than me, it's going to be completely different, you know? Um, yeah. What else did I do? I went around, me and my master, I went around the market and bought some cheese. You get these like big mm. blocks of um, Charlesburg cheddar, like wow. probably 400 gram blocks. We got, for, uh, I believe, three blocks for five British pounds. So it's like $7 if that. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty yeah, chuffed that, myself. But they always have this deal on. A local local butcher by me just started carrying um, raw cheese from a local creamery. So I'm pretty psyched about that. And I'll get some uh, this week. I put in an order. So taste test. <laughs> That's right. Isn't it? Yeah. Me, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I've managed to get a local supplier as in like six minute walk down the lane, which is raw milk. That works good for me. Um, I've been buying about six liters a week and mm. Sophie's looking at getting some raw goat's milk from a local farm or something. So we'll have a nice little mix there. But um, outside of that, we just eat like mince. Um, we have to get fish yeah. from the supermarket, which is annoying. Um, but mm -hmm. there's not really a cheap way to get fish over here, it seems. But you can't. There's not really, we don't really have fishmongers over here. We just have like a butcher and they might have some frozen fish if you're lucky. So Interesting. Yeah, I'm right. I'm on the east coast of the United States, and um, Rhode Island is very coast coastal with a big seafood industry. So I I pretty much always have access to local oysters and uh, local monkfish. If you look up a monkfish, you feel like a pretty big badass for eating that thing. It's one yeah. ugly fish, but uh, sure, 
What'd you say? Do you ever do like fish and stuff? Like, do you ever have days where you just eat like loads of fish? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I do sometimes. I kind of just let my body tell me when that's going to be. Like, I don't plan, like, oh, I'm going to load up on a bunch of seafood. Uh, mm. But it's interesting. It always seems to um, come about in the winter. And I'll get, like, salmon cravings or sardine cravings. And then I, I just wonder, like, is that my body trying to take in more vitamin D in the depths and darks of winter? Maybe. It really is, know. isn't it, really? I mean... Yeah. There's two ways that there because like you get the vitamin D from the fish itself. Um, you get the DHA that yeah. helps your skin and um, what's the word? There's a technical word for it, like susceptibility to absorb vitamin D through the sun. So mm. probably double whammy there. Um, I, I always like oily fish. It seems like yeah, I do, I do loads of fish and um, eggs and raw cheese, raw, raw dairy. So. Yeah. And then oysters, oysters, I will plan like that. That for me is like, let's boost the immune system. Let's get the little zinc bombs in there. It's like my drug of choice is oysters. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that was zinc, isn't it? Cause people always think like the carnival diet, you have loads of zinc in your diet as it is. Mm. Then you eat food like zinc and you suddenly like you light up and you feel much better. Yep. Right, it's it? just so concentrated. I think. Yeah. You've got your um, first question, actually, Jacqueline. Um, just right. so for anyone who doesn't know, we've started a bit impromptu. But, um, Jacqueline is a a statistician. That was your profession, wasn't it? That was your um, era of study. Yeah, I was and a... Now you... a s- go ahead. You go ahead. Go on. I was a statistician and a, a trained statistician. And then um, in my role, which... I got hired to be a a statistician. I kind of got shifted over to a community engagement type uh, role in academia. So I was out with with the people, which was a blessing. Um, uh, But I've since left uh, the academic space to uh, work as an educational consultant. And I go into schools or just work with families because not everyone's in public schools uh, on supporting autistic students, autistic youth, even autistic adults, autistic people getting ready to go to college or out into an apprenticeship, whatever, uh, just providing that kind of support. Do you get a good, um, what's the word? Do you find you get a good reach from that and people find it useful? Because obviously we have um, different schemes in different countries and counties to help mm-hmm. autistic folk. Do you find that the service you're providing is well received, like people Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, to get people to actively take part in the things that you're sort of, um, advocating. You know, it's interesting because it really depends on the place and the mainstream quote gold standard treatment uh, or support system for autism is ABA, which many people have heard of. ABA is like the big pharma of the autism world. And it's the thing that all the doctors say, like, get that kid into 40 hours of ABA immediately. Um, No child should have a 40 hour per week job. I think my theory is that that programming will fuck someone up more uh, for taking them out of play and nature and everything else and basically putting them in compliance training uh, than if they had no support at all. Uh, But that's the thing that just keeps getting suggested over and over, much like a drug or a pharmaceutical in the nutrition world. Um, And some places are so entrenched in that and so blind to the whole capitalistic nature of it uh, that it's really resistant. They're like, no, I'm doing what's best. They, They have the best intentions, like they want to help, but they truly believe that is the best thing. And I'm like, let's start with basic needs, like, You know, does this person, do they have their health? Do they have safety food? What's their diet like? Um, Movement, movement is huge. Sunlight is huge. Um, You know, I understand how all this screen time comes about, but that's also a huge contributing factor. Like, I'm not, I, I, I don't believe you ever cure autism your brain structures develop and they're going to be different. Um, But 
you can make it a much more comfortable, well-regulated and, and really high quality of life from what it often yeah. ends up being. Yeah, I, I agree the same thing, because obviously we're two people who have benefited from the things you just mentioned. Um, right. It's odd, though, because when I'm creating my YouTube videos, I talk about autism ever. It's so hard to know what to title them as, because it's I don't want to say you're going to eliminate autism and, you know, you'll be normal, because yeah. that's just that's disrespectful to everyone that has autism. You know, there's pros and cons, you, you but know, what I want to say yeah, is there's symptoms know. that can improve, you know? Yeah, I, I think... You know, there's a whole um, idea that uh, there's not really more autism. It was just underdiagnosed before. It's like a, it's something that that people say, um, and then some people say, "Well, that like that's just lazy. Like we we'd notice if people were autistic." But I think um, I think it's it it could be true that there were just as many autistic people then as there are now but they weren't getting into these clinical symptoms that are so, uh, that interfere so much with quality of life and functioning like we are now when we have all the interactions of our diet, our lifestyle, our environments. And so you just, you see autism spiral into absolute mayhem because anything that is damaging to a brain in general or mitochondria in general, it, for someone with a different brain and often with like more neural connections we've seen in uh, fMRIs and such, it, the effects are more, they're greater, they're, they're more disabling even than it would be to um, someone who's not autistic and it's disabling to people who are not autistic as, as well. So. Mm. Um, I think our lifestyle and environment has become a really intense interaction for when someone has that autistic neurotype that it's more likely we, we just see these really hard um, symptoms. That's an interesting concept because I never personally looked at it that way. Um, to shed light on something about myself and people like us that I would never would have come up with and it's really interesting because mm. I think what you're basically saying is the same there's probably about the same number of autistic people that exist now versus 50 years ago yeah. um, but the current lifestyle impacts that we have um, the way we live now is essentially much more different than how we lived 30 years ago yep. so I think you, you see a lot more people escalating to like debilitating um, amounts of dysregulation, more sensory overwhelm, so much dysregulation and sensory overwhelm and lack of neurological development that any form of communication, I mean, even sign language and typing and augmented forms of communication, like symbolic capacity might not develop like that. That's intense. And I, I don't, I think a lot of that has to do with um, with harms that are interacting with just the nature of perhaps a different brain structure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, not at all. No. Um, what you've got to say about water is much more in detail than in, and in depth than what I have. To be honest. Um, <laughs> it's, it's something you're, you're, um, You've got expertise in, so I'm, I'm glad you can say anything about it. It's um, it's very interesting. And I, what I kind of hope is that you coming onto this platform and hopefully lots of other people um, is you'll get invited one day to like low carb down under or some keto convention and be able to talk about this sort of thing. And people could think, oh, I didn't think keto was for autistic children or carnivore or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually speak on this thing. You can provide some broad examples and say, you know, I've spoken to all these people and they've tried it and here we go, you know? Yep, absolutely. That would be, that would be the dream. Spread the word. If, if, if we could change that first interaction between parents and doctors where it's like, I'm so sorry to tell you, like, you've got an autistic child, you need to get them into that 40 hours of essentially what is compliance training and having a young child sit at, a, like, sit still at a table so unnatural for any child we're not just talking autistic children mm. uh 
inside, always in a respondent role, that kind of thing. No, no bueno. We want to say, you know, so your child's brain is different and it's really important you know this and there are dietary and lifestyle factors that can make this thrive essentially i mean i mean i don't know about you but i i feel like i get tons out of my life and it's not that there's not barriers and challenges here and there but in many ways i feel like i have advantages in some domains in many ways i feel like it's how i came to accept carnivore so readily because it's like relying on logic and reason and not just uh, social norms that are shoved down my throat right yeah i've always been a bit the same anyone that knows me um on a very personal level knows i don't really follow any social norms you know i'm quite quite out of the yeah. box there um it's funny really because when i was diagnosed i was 21 years old so i'm 27 now so or six i mean nearly seven years ago um I was put into a post-diagnostic support group. Um, I thought, you know what, if I was such a brilliant human being and doing so well and felt so good about myself, um, I wouldn't need to go to this. But I thought, you know, I, I, I need to improve some areas of my life. You know, I, I don't feel great. Um, essentially, what it was is a quick start course on anxiety and depression. Um, now, it's the same... It was useful for me at the time because I did suffer with those elements very much so. Um, but I don't yeah. think it really addressed a lot inside of the idea of sensory issues, um, understanding your own wiring, because a lot of it was trying to understand other people. Yeah. But to understand other people, mm -hmm. you have to understand yourself. So what you just said makes very apparent sense to me, I think. Yep. And if you understand yourself, um, like other people, it's it's pretty much impossible to rely on another person to understand your brain. So if you understand yourself and can tell people about it, I think like it's possible to have great relationships um, with people who are like, oh, okay, that's why you do that. Cool, like yeah. that that's cool. Like we can understand each other and um, have a, have a mutual understanding about our differences and have a great relationship. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um... Part of the issue is like the like the Google side of it. So if, if my mum, for example, went on to she's in the chat right now, I think. If she went to oh. um Google and typed in autism or something, she'd read yeah. all this list of like these basic generic things and it's like what well, I don't really none of those really apply to me in the total sense. And obviously you're leaving it up to the reader to interpret what each one what one of those means. So I think yeah. it does have to be I think it does have to be spoken about more from people that actually have it, you know? You have to go yeah. direct to the source, I think, um, with like yeah. context, you know? Absolutely. You've got a question, actually, yeah. from um, Sophie. Oh, cool. Do you have tips for getting a child to try foods they don't like? Um, so, well, my ideal, like I, I started to say, is that the first message to parents is about diet and lifestyle because I think like anyone who is autistic or most people who have raised autistic children might be able to tell you like once that kid finds something that they're comfortable eating like they will want that something every single time so if that thing is meat or and whole foods and fish and um fat and eggs and raw cheese and raw milk, those will become the things, um, the same foods, the things, the, the, the comfortable routine foods. So that's like my ideal. But given that many people are trying to shift from maybe a standard Western diet or standard American diet um, to something more whole foods, I think um, although it feels urgent, um, small steps are the best way. And in terms of foods that they might think they don't like, or they've tried before, but, and, and didn't like, but maybe want to try again as they age or their palates develop or whatever. There's actually a really interesting article that I give a lot of people. And it's this mom who is married to an autistic guy and has like 
I don't know, three or four autistic children. And this mom was like, I was at my, my wits end making like four different meals every single night for, <laughs> for these people in my household. And she started to watch like Hell's Kitchen or put Hell's Kitchen on and all the kids and the, the dad started watching it. And it was enlightening to them because they would watch Gordon Ramsay go through a line of people who made the same food. But on one dish, he'd be like, this is disgusting. The texture is horrible. Uh, this is like fucking horrific and throw it in the trash can. And then like you get to the next one and be like, this is amazing. And they started having uh, like dialogue around just because it's eggs doesn't mean it's always going to taste the same. There are many different ways to make eggs. There are scrambled eggs. There are hard boiled eggs. Uh, you know, there is chicken. There are chicken thighs. There are chicken breasts. There is ground beef, steak. There are all these different forms of food that we can change the texture and the taste of based on how we prepare it. And so their household started kind of having these open experimental cook-offs where they would make food and they'd keep track of the ones that they liked um, really methodically and the ones they didn't. And they were completely allowed to be like, to like take a bite of something and be like, I fucking hate this and like curse it out and spit it out and use all the Gordon Ramsay dramatics. And that made it fun and engaging for them as a family. And so that might not work for everyone. Uh, but I think the more fun you can have with it and the more methodically you do it and making sure that you're letting those kids know you have every right to absolutely hate this. Um, I don't care. Throw it back at me, but, but, but try it. It, 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 it. I think it would work for a lot of people because it's just fun to have that permission as a kid. <laughs> yeah. I think make, making food fun is quite, it's quite an interesting idea because we, you know, we, we eat to live. We don't live to eat kind of thing. But part right. of learning to enjoy food is that we know how to do it. You know, we know how to cook. We see the value in it. Um, so what we try and do with um, Tilly, so she's, Sophie's talking about Tilly, she's five years old. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying to get her to eat a more carnival-ish diet. Um, she is yep. probably about 70% carnival. Um, mm. But we, what we do sometimes, we try and do baking. Um, so we, our baking is now like a carnival pancake. Um, it's not the cleanest thing to eat, but it's light years ahead of what you'd be feeding a kid otherwise. Um, yeah. And we do the same thing like you mentioned with the recipes. So I like my carnival protein butter bites to be a very specific recipe. Now, when yeah. you look at our chronometer or our nutrition tracker things, you'll see Jonathan's butter bite v, V1, Jonathan's butter bite V3, V2, V4, <laughs> Sophie V B, 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 well, B. We have all these different variations of, of the same sort of thing. We're talking about like minute 10 gram differences, but we we do find that fun between us because we can find a recipe with, oh, this one's more like fudge. This one's more like, I don't know, ice cream, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So I think that's quite, that's quite useful advice. We never considered that. So thanks for that. Yeah. Naked Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Rick in the chat, he said, I found the source of my overheating engine. Thermostat fell apart and blocked the water pump in the... I'm not yes. an engineer, so I, don't, I won't comment on that. <laughs> um, I just started carnivore in January and I've lost 45 pounds already. I weighed a whopping 486 pounds and now I weigh 441. I just shared my first video last night if you'd like to follow my new journey. That may be interesting. Um, Carnival Kip, if you're still in the chat, please leave your comment below the video. Um, mm. and I'll check it out later. People can also do the same if they want to find your channel. Um, I can't click on your channel right now because I'm on a separate software streaming app, so I can't actually look. But if you comment below, I'll have a look and subscribe. Yeah. Sensory issues mess with my sleep. I've been waking up at 2 to 3 a.m. If anything is off, it's a struggle to get back to sleep. What increasing fat help on carnival and coffee? What do you think? Increasing fat could help, um, even just calories generally. I find if I've been a little under-caloried for some time, I will uh, kind of bolt 
up in the middle of the night very consistently after about four or five hours of sleep and it will be hard to fall back asleep. Um, so upping fat is a safe bet because you're going to up the thing that contributes to your hormonal health the most and by nature that will up your calories. So I think that's a good bet. And then of course, anyone with coffee who's also carnivore, um, my, my metabolism of caffeine, I feel changed greatly when I dropped um, car all carbohydrates out of the picture. So I'm very cautious to only have, if I have caffeinated coffee, it is my first cup of the day. It is not when I first get up, it is after an hour or so of being up, already have had it, already have had it, having had natural light in my eyes. Um, and then I will have that caffeinated cup of coffee. Um, and for me, that's like, I, I, I can't do it beyond about 11 a.m. any longer. Um, otherwise, it could mess with my sleep. So I, I would, those would be my main things to think about and suggestions for you. Yeah, I'm thinking probably the same thing. I think what we need to do, Jacqueline, is if you ever get um, more spare time, we should do almost like a neurodivergent day of living kind of thing, like all the things we think about from start to finish um, during our day. That would be what really, we... really interesting. Because we, we, we'll probably be more inclined to be more um, yeah. sort of pedantic about different things, more particular, you know? Yeah, also... Um... You just made me think, Jonathan and Susie, I wonder, um, do you do any kind of exercising, working out? Um, because that also like, helps my sensory and my sleep rhythm so much. Um, just bringing myself down a few notches um, most days will, is, is so powerful, I find. Yeah, I find... Um... I find the blue light in gyms very distracting. I don't feel good with it. Like I, I usually leave the gym. Um, I, I since left the gym. Um, I've started up a new one recently. I'm going to be yeah. training outside probably half the time that I train nowadays. And the days I train outside, I feel so much better. Like my anxiety is lower. My sleep seems better. My skin seems better. So I think there's a lot of benefit to be had from doing one, doing the exercise, and two, doing it ideally outside if you can. It doesn't have to be a, a gym workout. I can just be go for a walk. You know? Right, right, absolutely. Very, very good advice. Cheers, Jeffrey. Um, we just had to remember which version we preferred. Tilly gets involved cooking. I wish she ate more cheese and egg. I add eggs to what I can. Yeah, so Tilly is what you call a quite healthy child. Like she's, um, she's strong. She's physically active. Um, she's tends to eat quite well. Like she probably eats. On the side of eating more, which we want at a young age, we don't want children being malnourished at all. It's um, not helpful. Right. Um, she has good, good skin, good hair, and you know, all the sort of vital signs of a healthy, growing child. Um, we're mm -hmm. just conscious of the potential that she might have ADHD, and the the best kind of things we can do to mitigate that. Um, like, kind of, she's very—I don't know what word is maybe she's very expressive, very emotional at times um she can't yeah. grant she's five years old she can't control our emotions like as well as we can as adults but speaking from experience having neurodivergent brain i can say i wish i knew the stuff i knew now a lot younger so it's kind of like how do you relay that onto a to a five-year-old you know right right and i mean they're they're smart and observant and you know i think we can't discount that if we can get people trying these foods, they might notice a difference in how they feel and their energy. And when they do have other foods that we might necessarily not want them to have, um, they will feel that too. I, I think, I mean, kids are so adaptable and they have a lot larger margin for error when it comes to adding sugar into the system or um, more fruit. I, I mean, I think, you know, letting them have those things is totally fine and, and almost impossible to avoid in some situations. But if you can get, like you said, 70 to 75% of their diet, making sure they're getting quality proteins and fats from animal sources, 
they're going to be miles ahead. Mm. How was your diet growing up out in Chess, Jacqueline? You know, it's, it, it is interesting. I will say it's certainly the case that I had my fair share of like cereals and snack foods that were standard American fare. But um, my, my family was um, Sicilian, Italian. So I like never grew up without a garden. If we were eating like tomatoes or sauce, the tomatoes were grown in the garden and then sun dried on cement blocks and then boiled and the skins were removed and the seeds were removed and uh, they were like processed in the traditional way. Um, never shied away from meats and fish and um, even like cured meats and cheeses and olives. Um, I, I was definitely raised on olive oil, not seed oils. Those were like a joke in, in the Italian family. Um, it, it was... Overall, I'd say I had 70 to 80% of my diet was very whole food. If it was vegetables, it was processed the right way or the safest way. Um, when it was breads, it was like homemade ravioli on holidays and such. I actually, which made me hate pastas and things out of the boxes. Uh, so I had some good um bases for for beginning and um i don't know how but i i remember when like i can't believe it's not butter came out which was like a terrible margarine awful thing my mother would straight up call it like i can't believe it's not a heart attack so yeah. somehow she wasn't fooled by um, that kind of scheme. And I did have a lot of eggs, a lot of butter, a lot of olive oil. And, um, and then of course, yeah, like I, I'd go to school and have the lunches there. Sometimes I'd go, um, be out on the road for soccer and have t big carby meals at times. But, um, my, my home base, home cooked meals were were actually pretty decent. Yeah, that's a bit quite different to me. Um, <laughs> I grew up very disordered eating. I'd only eat foods which were white, unless they're like carrots or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. Fifty percent processed, pretty much. Wow. Yeah, no deal. Never mind, me now. Um, right, Michael asked. Jacqueline, what are your thoughts on the magic pill? Assuming he means the, um, the film or the documentary. You know what? I've never seen the documentary. I will I will have to watch it. Um, I, have you watched it, Jonathan? I watched about 20 minutes of it the other day. Um, I couldn't get into it. I think it's just the way I am at the moment. So I used to be able to watch films. But the way I am now, I don't... I think cause I spend so much screen time online, YouTube, uh, consultation, you know... Um, I, granted, I don't spend all day, like eight hours in front of a uh, light, light screen, but I find I can listen to some things if it is the, the, the audio is formatted in a way that I can just listen to it. So I listen to podcasts. Um, yeah. I can listen to Bart Kay's videos at um, air at 8.30 UK time mm -hmm. and go to bed. But some other stuff I just can't watch. But yeah, it's probably something I do need to listen to at some point. Yeah. I just pulled up a uh, little description of it. It sounds like sounds like it's interesting. Mm. Diet and and based on dietary changes, so uh, probably something we would appreciate. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's going to be like well surprised when we watch this that we haven't seen this because I've heard of this thing so many times, and it's like I'll watch that at some point, but just haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Well, if I uh, get some time to do some homework, uh, it, I'll, I'll prioritize it. <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah, that's a great idea. I I um I train outside most of the year. I had to bring my stuff in like right before Christmas because we got a polar vortex thing, and I didn't really want to be failing on pull ups because my fingers were numb and not actually because of muscular failure. Um, 
so it's inside for now, but I'm going to have to bring it back outside because it was so, so good. Keeps you outside for a nice chunk of time. Yeah, I always enjoy sprint training. I mean, I used to sprint competitively at the age, I think, about 13, 14 years old. Um, I felt really good when I was doing it. Like, I, I had that sort of, I don't know, you probably, we have it with the things that you're interested in, like intense focus on some things. Then I'd look at how the top sprinters would run. I'd look at my own form. I'd video myself on my one camera on my phone. Was sort of thing trying to suss out what I need to do better. Um, yeah, I always felt better when I was sprinting. Looking back, was it, I can't do it now. My body won't let me. But it's something I would like to to do in the um, in the near future if I can. Yeah. Absolutely. If anyone's got any questions for, chat, um, for Dr. Faye, please just put them in the chat. She um, she suffers with autism as well. I say suffers, but um, she probably deals with it a lot better than most people, I think. And she's got some brilliant insights into the topics around it. Um, she, I did um, I did have a video of her probably, probably close to about a month ago now. Um, it's on my yeah. channel somewhere. It's quite popular, actually. And you've also been on Bart Kay's channel. How do you find yeah, that? Yeah, uh, uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, we, we definitely have a uh, a lot in common, and our uh, background and background in and disdain for the academic world is one of them. Um, so we we did a video together, and actually, I I just talked to him again last night, um, and i uh, kind of t discussing that idea of signal to noise ratio that he brings up a lot in his critiques of uh, people who just kind of go around spewing uh, research uh, on the internet without any context or understanding of what's really happening in, in the research or how meaningful or meaningless it might be. So that was a lot of fun and I'm sure that will be coming out soon. Yeah, I think it's quite valuable because, you know, everyone throws up studies on the screen. I mean, what people notice of my channel is there's very few times where I actually put up a study unless I think, right, this is clearly indicating something here and it's worth reading in if you don't believe what I'm telling you for a YouTube video. Um, do your own research kind of thing. But oftentimes you're kind of extrapolating things. You're giving your own experience and people need to be very deliberate and clear when they're doing that. And I find it quite frustrating because... There's um, the fruit guy that is a carnivore, supposedly. Um, I think he, he lives in Costa Rica or somewhere like that. And he, um, oh, yeah. he made a video two months ago, maybe three months ago, and I, he had about five studies on the screen, like one by one, said, this study showed that. And I went for each study, so I thought, you know what? I'm going give to this, give this guy the benefit of the doubt and actually read what he's saying. I'm not just going to discredit it or whatever. And I read for each one. And four out of the five of them were complete junk. Like They weren't relevant to what he's talking about. Um, you couldn't apply any of way or method that they'd be in any way specific to the context. They were so reductionist and they just didn't, they didn't hit the point in the video. It's like, as if he just typed in, um, I don't know, whatever it was, fruit or something, fruit and mitochondrial health, picked one that said it was good and just put it on the screen. Like you didn't, yep. you didn't analyze it. You didn't, there's no application sort of, um, what's the word? There's no, an, a, there's no analytical side of it, you know. Yeah. What yeah. do you think about that? And you do, do you see that a lot of videos, like in like informative videos at least? Yeah, I think well, the unfortunate truth is that you can go to Google or Google Scholar and look up like fruit good for mitochondrial health. And you'll find mm. something somewhere that backs it up. And if you've already entered with that bias of you believe that because of your N of one experience, um, you're, you're not going to come at it with that um, analytical lens. Unfortunately, you know, the human brain is great, but it's limited. We have a lot of, um, it, it has a lot of things it does for efficiency that aren't always uh, practical and if you're not aware of the fact that your brain is going to be um, prone to a confirmation bias meaning it will be more likely to remember and attend to things that already align with what it believes and less likely to attend to and remember things that it doesn't believe um, 
strictly for energy use and efficiency. If you don't know that about your brain, you're not going to stop and think, hold on, hold on. Let, let me, let me really take this in. You're just going to say, yep, yep. This goes along. Yep. Yep. Confirm, 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 confirm. Cause it's easy. And uh, I think that happens way too much. And I think people never give a context of, um, I found this one article in uh, a result pool of thousands uh, and all of them say different things, right? Mm. Uh, regardless of how good the study was, there's, there's always tons of research that are finding uh, very nuanced things, very conflicting things. So yeah, I think we, man, m many more people outside of the academic sphere are much more aware of that danger that you can find a correlation or a study for anything you want now uh, after the years we've lived through, I think. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is why we, it's important we have these sort of discussions when um, like two autistic carnival people, if, if you're talking about autistic carnivals onto YouTube or Google, normally people come up. So we do have to be the pioneers of this sort of thing. Um, now, if you type in autism, depression, autism, um, overweight, obesity, loads of yeah. stuff will come up. So we've, we've got to sort of really um, advocate for this sort of thing. So just because I've noticed such a huge difference. Causes of autism. Mm. Mm. I think there can be, I think there are many. Um, and I think it's, it happens very early on from research, some quality research that we do have. I think that it can range from like a natural neurodiversity thing that just happens to, uh, there are pretty good studies to show that um, parents who have less intake of, I think it's L-carnitine, um, have a higher likelihood of uh, an autistic child. Again, that's probably going to contribute to just differential developments in the structure of the brain. Um, but this this can happen really early on. There's also interesting studies with um, babies in the in the womb, so fetuses in the womb, and they are recording responses of these fetuses throughout the pregnancy, essentially. And they don't, they obviously don't know which ones are going to go on to be diagnosed as autistic at some point in their lives and which ones will not. But what they find is that for those who do not go on to be diagnosed as autistic in the womb, they respond to the sound of their mother's voice in particular and human voices um, in general differently than environmental stimuli. Whereas those who go on to be diagnosed later as autistic respond to human voices, their mother's voice and environmental stimuli pretty much the same. There isn't that like limbic reward system light up that we see in non-autistic. So this is early and this is, this is a brain difference that is happening before a person has even seen their first light of day, right? So, um, I think, I, I think given that knowledge, the, the causes could be so wide and varied and parents are exposed to the same environments and lifestyles and things that we all are. And how does that affect the amniotic fluid and, and the, the biology? I, the, yeah. the science is so young, we, I, I can't even pretend to uh, really know more than that. Yeah, you can't. It's very hard to pinpoint these things. I did make a video, um, I think it's titled Beating Autism or something. And I said in a video, like, look, th this is what some things can can cause it, but there's hundreds more. I'm not just, I couldn't label all of them sort of thing. Um, the thing is, in your individual circumstances as a fetus, some things will impact you more or less. Um, you know, the heavy metals will be, I mean, environmental toxins, your mother's diet, um, the, the quality of your genetics, whatever it is. Um, 
there's and that's just in the fetus alone there's probably like 20 more things i'm not thought, thought about so it's a lot to unpack um right Yeah. 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 And it's also especially like single time points. Um, so not only N of one, but also N of one at one time point, even more red flag there. But it's, it's nice that, you know, your, your audience, Jonathan and like Bart's audience, they, they're, they're on to these things. It's just the wider, community might not be. And I, you know, I watched, um, I think it was Bart who was doing a uh, critique of a, a video where um, Fruit and Honey Doc was really suggesting that honey was perfectly fine for like diabetic people. Uh, that That's another huge problem. Like you're gonna take your own situation, find some research that backs up your point and tell diabetic people to drink honey. Like, even if you think it's okay for you as a metabolically healthy person, isn't your job as a doctor to first do no harm? And do you really want to take that risk? That is obscene. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Because I made this point on the last live q and with, with Bart. Um, I sort of said people accuse him of being very, like, black and white, you know, be zero carb, zero plant, this, that, and the other. And the thing is, if you say to someone, well, yeah, you can have a tablespoon of honey and you're not going to die, it's like people can take that tablespoon and make it a bigger tablespoon, then it's going to end up being potatoes, then French fries. Dipped in, like, they'll just keep pushing the boundary. So that's why people that are responsible have to say, look, this is, this is the best way to do things. The further you go from that, the worse outcomes you're going to have. Um, it might not be that you, you die sort of thing, but you're you're not going to feel 100% in comparison to it. And I'm, I'm going to have probably two clients that do some um, lower toxic fruit and some honey, um, yep. not because I advise it, but because they notice themselves, they feel a bit better, helps them stay on the diet, which is, you know, you know, like compliance is a science sort of thing. If you can find a way to comply a bit better, then that's going to keep people in a better health state than just say, no, never eat this. And um, right. it puts them off, you know. And I like, I'm not at a point in my journey where I want to really play around with too much because I'm feeling so good. Um, but one of one positive thing I think is that even though you have fruit and honey doc and a few others who are really well known, and I mean, that guy's eating like a cutting board full of fruit. I mean, this is not like I'm having a a, a little quarter cup of blueberries on the side and, sh and, and saying, go have at it like 300, 400 grams of, of carbohydrates with uh, between the honey and the fruit. Many people on like average people who are not these huge in influencers, if you see them post their meals and they use fruit and honey, it will be like the end of their last meal. They put some berries and a, teaspoon of honey on some yogurt and that is the extent of it and I think if you're going to make a case that it has a place it would be in these small quantities when it is locally available to you for that period of time not a cornucopia of upside down pineapples and papayas and mangoes and bananas and so on and so forth every morning and every evening with also uh, tons of organ meat and such. Yeah, I agree. I think I could probably get away, get, I said get away. I could have fruit in my diet without having serious health consequences quite, quite well. Um, yeah. The thing is, I want to advocate to people that you can do it in the complete absence of carbohydrates through plants. Right. Um, build muscle, sustain muscle mass. And then it kind of shows people, right, I'm a beacon of hope to people that cannot eat fruit because they are metabolic and healthy, but want to build muscle mass. Um, yeah. and I'm very meticulous. I don't sort of, um, I'm very upfront. Like I have one out of every, 
I believe it's one out of 112 meals I have every month is a non-carnival meal. Mm. Um, so that's why I say that's like my disclaimer. So people could see me out at a restaurant and it doesn't sort of um, mean I'm eating terrible all the time. But um, right. yeah, I mean, have you found that with yourself? Do you find that you're eating strict all the time and you just, you're, you're put off by the idea of um, not feeling as good as you do now? Yeah, I think especially because I am literally like seven, seven-ish months out from uh, recovery. I'm, it, it's almost like I, I, I'm, I have a fear of, <laughs> of adding uh, things back in, you know, like someday I hope I get to the place where I'm like, oh, let me try some spices and herbs if I want to, or if I'm out at a restaurant, I'm not going to worry about what else they put on this thing I'm ordering. Um, but right now, like I, it's, it's so hard to want to mess around with it. So I, I pretty much do mostly red meat, um, but also some seafood. And I, I've always been able to do the, the raw cheese, the raw dairy stuff. Though, if I go absolutely nuts with that and have like ounces and ounces with every meal every day sometimes I get a little reaction over time like over a week or so of doing that like really relentlessly uh, I'll do eggs butter and tallow um, and I do mostly decaffeinated coffee and that's never been an issue for me I've tested without any coffee at all decaf and caffeinated and uh no, no, no real differences. In fact, I, I don't know mm. if I'm like a super metabolizer of caffeine because I, I drank, I used to drink for like six to eight years. I had probably eight to 12 cups of regular coffee every day, just like without thinking about it straight up till bedtime, just always sipping it. And one day I was like, you know, I've been doing this for a while. Let me just see what happens without caffeine just to make sure. And I went off it for four, four or five months. I uh, never even got like a single dull headache or anything. Like nothing happened. So, I've that's an, that's an individual difference. That's an N of one. Uh, yeah, case I think right there, there. Are, are people out there where caffeine is innocuous, or at least um, to your own like uh, subjective experience. Right. But myself, I don't have an addiction to caffeine. I can quite easily not have it. Um, I, I have pre-workouts for the gym sometimes. Sometimes I have a stim-free one. Um, you know, that's what one of my sort of um, what's the word? My defects I I have my my infringements. Um, aside of that, Your I can vices. have a coffee. Yeah, my vices. That's what. Yes, yeah, so I can't. I can like not have these things, but I I do quite like them. And I think that's where it comes into it because i mean if i if for example i was to be strict carnivore no sweeteners nothing no whatever um then go out for a meal with my family and there's no meat in england like you can't eat a carnival diet anywhere it's impossible unless you bring food mm. into the restaurant yourself um i'm going to react very badly to that meal but i notice mm. if i have that one meal a month or whatever it is i almost have a slight tolerability to it so that's yeah. my own little, in, little experience. But in your case sort of thing, um, you're someone that can probably, probably be a bit more strict, um, have more rules set so you can adhere to it better. So it's more practical for you to just say, no, I'm not going to eat this. You know? Yeah. And um, I guess, I guess the only other place where like I try to be, less strict as if I'm traveling somewhere and there's like some food or something that is so iconic of that place. And I have the op the opportunity to have it like traditionally made by those people. Then I'm like kind of all in on that because that's, that's just a great experience. Yes. It, it's the it's experience, isn't it? Cause these things are like, if, if you look at his, our history, we've always celebrated some things with some kind of meal or food. Right. And it might mean that you're going back to, to where you're from um, and they have a certain meal that you think, oh, I really enjoy that. The nostalgia effect, because I have that 
every time yeah. I go to my nan's house, I always imagine having like I don't know, well, I've not had it yet, but like pancakes, or I might think of having a cheese sandwich. Like for me, those things are like nostalgic. They remind my nan, and I used mm. to enjoy having them. So that's kind of my yeah. little little thing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I just feel like th there are so many different autistic profiles of people, um, but and and I don't. I would never make any grandiose claims again. Like I said, like this isn't to me, it's not like, Oh, we're trying to cure autism, but I think that a diet, especially one that gets rid of like gluten and refined carbohydrates and sugars and seed oils, um, whether ketogenic or carnivore, keto or anything in between, um, it's, it's going to improve quality of life for that person in some way and often in, in many ways. So I, I would definitely be interested in seeing how that went for uh, those, those children. Mm. Right. I've not heard of this for some reason. Oh, I haven't have either. You? I don't think I have. Yeah. I've heard of attachment have. disorders, but not, RAD it, in that context. Yeah, so is it a way that you interact socially that um, makes people believe you might be autistic? Um, mm. Attachment makes, it makes me think that um, it's how a person is brought up because you have the attachment uh, style. Insecure, avoidant, you know, all these sort of things. You know, like yeah. I can say I'm not very like touchy feely kind of person. I, I like to have my yeah. own personal space sort of thing. Um, as do I. But, yeah. I mean, have you looked at the, I think it's called the Briggs Meyer test? Oh, yeah. The, uh, the types. Types. I think I'm a, I did this so long ago. I think I'm an INTP. Yeah. You're the same as my dad. I'm a INTJ. Um, yeah. I find it funny because I, I don't believe you can identify someone as like four letters. I think it's a bit. Yeah. Um, whatever but yeah. I think people do fit into certain like brackets of like you're somewhere in this sort of space of people um yeah and when I Actually, look at myself it's... people people would people people that read the character types would identify me as that character type so it's works both mm. ways I'd identify myself as that and that's, that's, that's yeah yeah I actually I worked in like a a career center at my college for a while and they would use that as kind of just a introductory conversation to for people to think about what what kind of industries they might actually thrive in given their general typing mm. i don't think they yeah. ever like evaluated or oh. analyzed how that went for people yeah the, my, my brother's had this done at his workplace so they have different colors so for example you're a blue you're a red you're a yellow you're a green or whatever it is um I still need to work mm. out which one I am. I'm probably the miserable one that doesn't like people. <laughs> um, that's just a link I put up for anyone that might find useful. It's from um, a lady I spoke to called Dr. Rachel Brown. Might be good if you could collaborate oh. with her, Jack. You might know her. I've seen her name come up on a few podcasts that I listen to, and I haven't got to um, hear her talk yet, but I, I will do that. Yeah, she's effectively, um, she can't say a lot because of her place of work, her, the, the, West, mm. the establishment sort of thing. So mm. she's a bit limited in that regard, but she can talk about the mechanistic side of psychiatry. Um, she's well, well in, very well informed in that sort of thing. And I interviewed her recently, so that'll be out in probably about two weeks or something. Um, nice. Yeah, I think you guys would have a good, good chat if you could ever collaborate with her. That might be fun. Mm. <laughs> this is something I need to look up, look into tonight. I think after this show. Yeah. Ah. Uh, we'll do, Michael. You give it. You're giving us all the homework, but it's stimulating mm. homework, so I'm okay with that. Yeah, I don't mind reading something that's useful. I get Precisely. a sense. 
links all the time. Like I end up on my Facebook now, I end up like hiding posts from some people because I think it's rubbish. Hey, Jerome, you right? Interesting. Do you reckon it's like their gut can't adjust easily to different things? That could be an addictive Perhaps. behavioral reason. I don't know. Yeah, or just addictive in general. I mean, pattern oriented. I can see where the overlap, like routine focused, um, I can see where some of the overlaps might come to autism. Um, yeah, I will be interested to learn more. Yeah, same. Um, Bart told me he was, um, I can't remember what it was called. I don't want to use the wrong terminology and put words in his mouth, but basically it means his diagnosis said he won't do what he's told. And it's like a anti being told what to do disorder, something like that. Oh, oh, oh it might be, um, it's PDA. Uh, That's it, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, why can't I think of the acronym? Oh, uh, it's like demand avoidance, something demand avoidance. Yeah. Uh, uh, like pathological demand avoidance or something. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've worked with a lot of kids who have that label. Uh, but it's not, it's not too hard to work with them. It's, uh, mm. they're, they're just going to have to be leaders someday, leaders. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if I've got it, but someone, Lambs is actually in the chat now. So Lambs said to me, and um, we speak quite a lot off air, he's a good friend of mine on the channel. Um, and he sort of said, why don't you try fasting, you know, because of uh, basically the pain I'm in right now. Um, mm. And I thought, yeah, I could see some rationale behind it. Then I thought, should I? Then someone else said to me, no, do the complete opposite and eat loads of food. And I got a bit stressed mm. out and I ended up just eating loads of food. <laughs> Like, I don't know what happened to me. It's like, the, it like overwhelmed me and it's really weird. Cause I'm like, I'm someone I can stick to anything I tell myself to, you know, I can, if someone said to me, you'll win your next bodybuilding show if you eat nothing but, I don't know, grains of salt for like a month, I'd still do it. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, um, bizarre. We'll wrap this up in a minute. Cause I'm quite conscious of Jacqueline's time. And she has um, donated an hour of her day to stay with me and the channel. Oh, you, you've been out here for quite some time. Yeah, so me and Lambert like Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do. I do hours of these each month. I do um, probably four hours on Bart's channel. Um, five hours on Harry's channel. Three, six, about twelve hours on my own channel each month. So I'm quite. Hmm. I'm using wow. it as a way to the camera because it helps if. You're talking to someone i find and you've got a, a question to respond to but if i'm just looking at the camera above it's awkward as hell i don't like it so <laughs> do you think labels cause division i think there's a there, there's a line here so uh i i on one hand wholeheartedly agree and then on another hand also disagree so I think sometimes labels are really important because like it can be a safety. If I don't officially have a label, I lose access to things that could really help me. Um, so if I didn't officially have my diagnosis and I have an absolute meltdown at work and harm another person, uh, I, don't, I don't have anything to legally show why that happened. Um, and that that's important. However, um, we do, I think, have a problem with any group. So I see even in middle schools and high schools, I see like middle schoolers and high schoolers going around and I'm speaking just in terms of autism here because we could do this with any group, right? Um, there are some that are like, today I'm autistic, basically. <laughs> like, I, today I think I'm autistic, I'm autistic, I'm autistic. 
And that is really problematic for the people who really need access to that label in case something does go wrong. Um, I think a lot of them think they're like, kind of like social justice warriors <laughs> and being allies, like, oh, it's okay. We all, we all have these labels. We all have these odd things, but it's not helpful. It, it, it doesn't help. And then I think overall in society in general, there's like way too much focus on what groups are labeled, what things, and it's a distraction from um, a much larger issue. And the fact that the, the, the biggest labels that matter in my opinion are like political elites and like we the people masses down here. <laughs> so mm. I, yeah, it's, it's nuanced for me, but I think absolutely there are problems with the creation of division and groups and sects within a larger group that could be working together against causes that really matter. Yeah, I mean, it's I've a long only, answer. Sorry. <laughs> I, I've this is my own personal thing, so not something which is really applicable to other people. But I found the label for myself has been very helpful. It means I've been able to recognize symptoms that I have and notice that some days I have worse autism than other days. Um, mm. For example, I'll be less sociable. I'll be more inclined to be in a dark room. Um, I'll not be as friendly. My appetite will be weird, things like that. Um, but then I think on the other hand, it hasn't helped me in some senses because on job applications where I've put um, autistic spectrum disorder, because oftentimes they'll ask sometimes in medical forms or, you know, and you yeah. think, well, they're obliged to employ a certain amount of people by law to have certain things wrong, wrong with them, you know, a different uh, disabilities or lesser abilities in some ways. Yeah. Um, I found that when I've put that down in forms, it has only worked against me. Mm. I've never experienced, I've never experienced, experienced a benefit from someone else knowing that I've had autism. Apart from that, obviously, close family and friends where they've understood things better. So. Yeah, yeah. Right, we'll wrap this up shortly. We'll see what everyone else has got to say. Opposition defiant. ODD. Yeah, I mm. think it is that one. Face value is important. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of have to accept some people are just difficult to be around. Some people are just easier to be around. I mean, I noticed that it's like, an, it's like a personality type thing. Like, I quite enjoy speaking to people like Jacqueline, um, yeah. Bart, Harry, Jerome. Yeah. Like, the, the thing is that all these people I speak to are all slightly different in some way, or in some cases, very different. Um, it's like who you click with but sometimes yeah. it's going to be an indication that a person won't click with a lot of people because their symptoms cause a lot of problems that's what, that's what i think yeah excellent oh, brilliant well thank you very much for your time jacqueline um i'm gonna yeah, end the it's fun to be now. here um i appreciate you coming on because this is a, a day off for you so i don't really want to take off all your, all your time <laughs> but, um yeah we'll have to do a catch-up soon and um if anyone has any questions for next time, please let us know in the comments below. Um, leave a like as well, and please if you haven't already. So thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.